love, lust, relationships, books and songs have been written about all three. But if you want to really know about them, you should spend some time with biological anthropologist Dr. Helen Fisher. And we did. You could say she's written the book on love, but that would be an understatement. She's actually written six books examining subjects like the evolution, biology and psychology of human sexuality to the neural chemistry of romantic love and why we fall in love with one person rather than another. Dr. Fisher has also examined marriage and divorce in over 80 societies, adultery in more than 42 cultures, patterns on monogamy and desertion in birds and mammals, and gender differences in the brain and behavior. Her best-selling, recently revised and updated book, The Anatomy of Love, is a contemporary classic of love and the brain, and her two TED Talks about human connections have been viewed over 12 million times. I recently sat down with Dr. Fisher at the Aspen Ideas Festival to speak more about why and how we connect with one another and the intricacies of human relationships. So I want to talk to you about your beginning. Uh, how did you go into this? How did you think? How do you think now? Yeah. Well, first of all, I lie in bed at night and wonder what I think now that I will not believe in five years. I'm constantly wondering whether I've got it right. And I think that that's uh, important. How did I get into it? I wish I had a sexy answer to that. But basically, it's I'm an identical twin. And as an identical twin, by the time you're four, five, six, seven, everybody's asking you, you know, do you have the same cavities in your teeth? Do you have the same friends? Do you like the same food? So long before I knew there was a nature-nurture nature controversy, I knew there was biology to behavior. And then because uh, in my day in graduate school, they still believed that the mind was an empty slate on which environment just inscribed personality. And I knew that wasn't true. And so I thought to myself, if there's any part of human behavior that would have a biological origin, it would be our mating strategy, because that's what gives you the babies and passes on your DNA. So I thought to myself, okay, we're a pair bonding animal. There must be reasons why we evolve this, why we fall in love, why we feel attached, why we break up and form new attachments to other people. So I was led into it just because I was so interested in human nature. You know, so many anthropologists are interested in why we're all different. I'm interested in why we're all alike. Talk to me about MRIs, because uh, I was in, sitting in on your session today, and I think it's yeah. fascinating, because back in the day, probably when you first started this, the thought of actually getting inside the brain and looking at it wasn't there for you. I remember the moment that I uh, decided to put people in brain scanners. I was walking along in Greenwich Village in New York, and I thought to myself, I wonder if we have evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. Sex drive, feelings of intense romantic love, and feelings of deep attachment. And that these three brain systems in myriad different ways orchestrate uh, all kinds of love. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, Helen, you've really studied a lot of, of the sex drive already. And you know, we all know that's in the brain. And I studied a lot of the attachment. So I said, I think I would, it would be great to put people in MR, an MRI machine and try to understand the basic brain patterns. The, the basic brain region that, um, um, uh, that is associated with intense feelings of romantic love lies way below the cortex where you do your thinking, way below the limbic system associated with your emotions. In, in basic brain regions linked with drive, with focus, with craving, with energy, with wanting, and with motivation, the motivation to win life's greatest prize. And in fact, people say, you know, in our techie, high-tech age, this is going to disappear. Malarkey. That's absurd. You know, I mean, the basic brain region that becomes activated when you're madly in love with somebody lies right next to brain regions for thirst and hunger. We're not going to get rid of thirst. We're not going to get rid of hunger. And if we survive as a species a million years from now, we're going to still fall in love. Let's talk a little bit about technology, because I never thought of this until this session yeah. today, that this is a 24-7 singles bar, is how right. someone described it. <laughs> and then you talked about the car, which I'd never thought of this either. <laughs> Tell us what your thoughts are about cars and about technology and how that changes things. Well, you know, every single time there's new technology, everybody panics. It's called the, uh, you know, the negativity bias. You always think we're going to hell in a handbasket. And I began to think, now, uh, first, first of all, this is ridiculous. Uh, modern technology is changing how we court. I mean, we're texting, we're emailing, we're sending emojis to express our emotions, etc. No question about that. But um, even our modern dating uh, 
uh, services. You know, I'm chief scientific advisor to Match.com. And I keep telling the president, and she agrees with me, that um, this is not a dating service. This is an introducing service. Once you actually meet somebody in the bar, on the park bench, wherever, your ancient human brain clicks into action, and you court the way we always have. You smile the way we always have. You laugh the way we always have. You parade the way you always have. You listen the way you always have. So, I mean, when you really think about modern technology, is it that dramatic. I mean, going back to the late 1940s and the early 1950s, you know, the introduction of the wide use of the automobile. Well, suddenly they had a rolling uh, bedroom. Now tell me whether that isn't more important than swiping left or right on Tinder. <laughs> and how about the 1972 when we, when we you know, uh, legalized uh, the contraceptive pill? Well, suddenly women were unchained from thousands of years of worry about pregnancy and, 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 and social ruin. Now they could express their primal sexuality. So uh, sure, technology, I think, is improving things. I mean, you know, so many middle-aged people uh, can now meet somebody. Well, I'm, I'm too old to stand in a barn and meet the right boy. Uh, these are enabling, it's expanding our social networks, it's enabling people to love at every age. It's interesting uh, relationships is what you uh, study and look at in many respects. Uh, I remember distinctly a conversation I had with somebody as I was walking from a lunch in Washington, D.C., and he said, you know, in Akron, Ohio, they manufacture tires. In Detroit, they manufacture cars. In Washington, D.C., we manufacture relationships. And the whole city's built on relationships. Yeah. So talk to me about what you think are the similarities between like romantic relationships, business relationships. What, what are some of the interactions when it comes to relationships? I'm just so glad you asked that. Um, I, I recently, somebody pointed out to me that, Helen, you're not in the love business. You are in the relationship business. And that is true. And matter of fact, what I, I think that we've evolved four very broad styles of thinking and behaving, linked with the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen system. We're all a combination of all of them, but we have personalities. Anyway, these four broad styles of thinking and behaving. Now, for example, I think Hillary Clinton's very expressive of the uh, testosterone, you know, analytical, logical, direct, decisive, tough-minded, whereas Bill... I think is very expressive of a lot of the traits in the estrogen system. I mean, he cries easily. He feels everybody's pain. He, he, uh, whole world knows he can't stop talking. Uh, uh, and matter of fact, you know, Americans are wondering when we're going to have our first female president. I think we've had our first female president. <laughs> and I can understand why Putin uh, um, and Trump understand each other. They're both very high testosterone men. Uh, and, you know, whereas somebody like the, the former president of, of China, Hu Xindao, um, he's very expressive of the serotonin system. Modest, uh, uh, detailed, uh, traditional, conventional, follows the rules, respects authority, etc. And when you begin to understand the brain, you can begin to see political figures. You can, I mean, for example, George Washington was the right man at the right time in American history. And so it's opened a whole world for me, understanding personality. It's opening, uh, I, I was never interested in history, actually. I was always interested in prehistory, the beginnings. And now I'm captivated by today. So if you could have someone in this column and they're negotiating a treaty and the other person's in this column, is it easier to create? I mean, is it, talk to, or should they both be from the testosterone or does right. that create more conflict? Right, what you gotta do is understand who they are and then give them your perspective the way they can understand it. I don't think that the, any particular combination is necessarily most productive, but what is productive is understanding who you're talking to and then give them your data in ways that they can hear it. As a matter of fact, you know, we always have believed in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I think it's the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto themselves and they will hear you and you can win. Is chemistry or biology more important in a failed relationship? I mean, which contributes more? Could never know, you know. You never know these. It's very complicated. We're just beginning to understand the brain. It's all chemistry. It's all biology. And it's all culture. They go hand in hand. It's interesting. There's, there's been these studies about they, they bring couples in for couple therapy. And some of these people can be very good predictors. I, mean, I know you know all this stuff. but. But you might look at a couple and think, oh, well, they'll, they'll make it. And then the person there is like, no, because 
she said something rather dismissive. There's telltale signs, Absolutely. which is interesting. Talk to us about yeah. that in relationships. Well, I um, I give a lot of uh, speeches to couples therapists because I come with the biological perspective rather than the cultural, and they are steeped in, and as well they should be, steeped in your your childhood, your education, your expectations, etc. But there is a biological. We do have biological styles of thinking. So, I will say. Um, oh, for example, the very high person who's very expressive of the dopamine system in the brain. They are um, uh, curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic, mentally flexible. And they fall in love with a high serotonin type who's, who's traditional, conventional, follows the rules, respects authority. And at first they might really love, need that opposition. You know, the, the high dopamine person is grounded by the high serotonin person, and the high serotonin person gets the energy and the curiosity and the adventure of the high dopamine. But they have two children, you know, uh, the marriage goes on, and suddenly the high dopamine person says, well, why don't you want to go off to uh, the highlands of New Guinea with me? And the other one says, you don't get it, man. We've got two small children here. And so, but if you begin to understand that when people are in conflict, it's often, I think, um, having to do with biological styles. In other words, they have to realize it's not about me. You know, people, some people are stubborn, and they're not stubborn just because they hate you. They're stubborn because they're stubborn. And once you get to really understand the full style of thinking, and you can learn how to reach that style, you can build a happy marriage. Now, there's some people that aren't going to build a happy marriage. They married the wrong person. Right, right. Well, you know what's interesting? Getting back to Match.com, because I know you work with them. Yeah. Um, on the surface, it looks brilliant. I mean, it's almost like uh, going grocery shopping in a sense. This person, yeah. they're a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. You know, it's, yeah. just, oh, Jew, Jew. You know, you, you go through, it's all these checklists. We're perfect for each other. Yeah. And yet you bring the two people together, and a lot of times there's just no spark there at all. Exactly. Um, talk to me about that, because it seems like if you take all of this column and this column, they're perfect for one yeah. another, and in many cases it's not the case. Uh, no question about it, because, you know, as I always say to the president, this is not a dating service. This is an introducing service. We can give you the various things that you want. The only real algorithm is your own brain. No dating service knows your, your, your knows your, the intricacies of your childhood, the intricacies of what you're really looking for in a partner. We can give you a whole lot of people that might work, but you got to do the work of getting to know that person. And um, that we can't do for you. Back uh, when I first started in this business, which was a million years ago, we, we, there was like four TV stations. You know, yeah. it, was, it was real easy to go on the air and have a bunch of people watching you. Now I say you have to figure out some way to break through the clutter. There's there's a ton yeah. of stations. You can go on the internet. There's a zillion sites. Uh, you can probably date a million people. How do you break through the clutter and find that perfect person for you? It's a really important question because the one problem with all of these dating ser services, and they know it is what we call the paradox of choice or cognitive overload. You know, the human brain is not built to shuffle through a thousand different alternatives. And they know that the more alternatives you have, the less likely you are to choose any. And so what I say to people, I'm, I'm studying this right now from reading the, li the, li the literature. After, there seems to be a sweet spot in the human brain. You can cope with about five to nine alternatives. And after that, it's cognitive overload. You, you, you end up just, you're swamped and you choose nothing. So one of the things that I say to people who are in the dating world, you know, stop. After you've got nine okay alternatives, stop. And get, and stop switching left and right. Stop going on Match or anywhere else. Uh, and, and get to know one of these people better. you got to give people a chance. We're just not built for this huge abundance of alternatives. So pull it back and focus on some. That brain circuitry for romantic love is like a sleeping cat. It's going to wake up and you're off to the races in love. One final question. Uh, for somebody who's watching this because they're surfing around and they're, they're heartbroken, their girlfriend or boyfriend just broke up yeah. with them yesterday, what advice would you give them? It's an addiction. Uh, there's somebody camping in your head. You got to get them out. Treat it as an addiction. Throw out the cards and letters. Don't write. Don't call. Uh, no drama. Um, go do things with friends and relatives. Uh, and um, the one thing that we've learned about the brain that's really important to me is that time does heal. 
there's a brain region linked with feelings of attachment and the farther you get away from uh, that person the less and less activity you're going to find in that region so you will heal give it time but don't keep traumatizing yourself by calling by writing by texting you know if you want to get over alcoholism you don't keep a bottle of vodka on your desk get rid of the reminders of this person if they want to be your best friend say I'll love to be your best friend in three years after I get this over with and find somebody new but just don't keep trying get out there and find somebody else you want somebody who loves you you mentioned time does heal and eventually we run out of time so yeah. thank you so much for talking to us it's been fascinating thank you we'll be right back with this week's full frame close-up